Okay, so thanks for the invitation and thanks everyone for coming. Like David was saying, this is a project about financial aid and the supply and demand for higher education. And it's a joint work with uh, Nano and Seba, who are two colleagues also in the PhD program in, in the economics department. And the motivation for this project is that low-income students are underrepresented in higher education in most countries across the world, probably actually in all the countries around the world. And like, see, there are several different policies that governments try to do to mitigate this problem. And one of the most prevalent of these policies are subsidized student loans. For example, in OCD countries, 40% of the public expenditure in higher education goes into subsidized loan programs. And in Brazil, which is gonna be our setting, in 2014, it reached 22% of all the incoming students in, the, in private universities. And, and as you can imagine, finding the best way to allocate all this money is like a major policy challenge. And one of the main reasons why it's so difficult to find the best way to use this money is that when you compare the alternative of different designs, you have to take into consideration supply side responses. What I mean by supply side responses, you have to take into consideration the way in which colleges are gonna change their behavior because now you have, uh, you have uh, a financial aid policy in place. And there is like one particular response that I'm gonna be very interested in that I think has been understood and is extremely important in, the, in higher education is the fact that uh, pri colleges price discriminate a lot between students in the form of like giving grants, giving fellowships, giving tuition discounts. Colleges do a lot of price discrimination between students. And the students that usually get discounts are usually low income students who are also the same beneficiaries from the loans. So this raises the question of whether a lot of students that are currently today getting subsidized loans for the government, if they were not getting those loans, they could be getting these tuition discounts from the universities and still going to college anyway. So in mm -hmm. other words, you're spending all this money to try to push low-income students to education, but maybe a large share of this money is just crowding out other forms of support, such as these discounts and scholarships. So with this motivation in mind, what we're gonna to try to do in the project is to answer this question, which is, how can we allocate the students' loans more efficiently to achieve our goal, which is, which is to increase uh, the enrollment of low-income students in higher education. We're gonna do that in two, in two steps. The, the first part is gonna to be to try to document empirically what's the impact of the subsidized loan programs. And we think this is gonna have two sub-steps, which is part A, demand, which is demand for education. So how do federal loans change students' enrollment decisions? So is it really true that uh, when you give a loan to a student, he's more likely to enroll in college. So do the loans change the, the decisions that students make? And then part B, uh, how do, with the supply side, how do universities respond to these loans? Do universities like raise prices when students have more loans available? Do universities cancel the, their tuition discounts? Do universities cancel their scholarship programs when students have more, more financial aid available? So we're gonna first try to document those two things, how both students and colleges respond when there is more or less financial aid available. And then we're gonna to try to make sense of these results to be able to say something about policy design. So we're gonna begin by proposing like a model of the supply and demand for higher education that tries to uh, rationalize the results we got in part one. Then we're gonna use these results from part one to estimate our model and once we have this, this framework set up, we are gonna use the estimated model to simulate the outcomes of different policy designs or like or different ways in which this, this resource could be allocated. Always seen the framework of a loan program, but different ways of implementing this loan program and see which of them delivers the, the best outcome. And, uh, and the setting we are gonna be, be using for this project is Brazil. And we believe the findings you're gonna have here, they're gonna be useful for like, for many countries in many different contexts. But Brazil has a few things in the higher education market that are gonna make it really ideal to help us answer the question, this question. And the first thing that Brazil has is that we have high quality education data that covers the universe of students and institutions. And that's gonna be very important for our specific question because since you're trying to understand how what's the equilibrium impact of these loans, not only how one person changed its behavior, his behavior because of the loans, but 
how like the whole market changes because now we have more or less loans. It's going to be very important to observe not only like a few universities, but to observe everyone that's enrolled in higher education in any university, both in the private and in, in the public sector. A second feature of the Brazilian uh, higher education market is going to be very useful is the fact that this, the loan program is centralized and allocated uh, using a rule that's the same across the whole country. And that's going to give us the data to see for each student exactly which students have a loan, which students do not have a loan, and also exactly why certain students have loans and certain students do not have loans. That's for the whole country. So then knowing exactly like those rules and exactly who has a loan and who doesn't, we're going to be able to estimate how loans change student decisions. And then the, the final piece is going to help us answer our question is that recently there was like a drastic reduction in the availability of loans in, the, in Brazil, like very sudden. And that's going to allow us to observe two markets, I mean the same market, but in two situations. One situation with a lot of loans available and another situation with like not so many loans available. And then we're going to be able to see how colleges behave in those two different situations, which is going to help us answer the second part of the question with how do, how do colleges change their behavior because there are more or less loans available. So, so we're going to begin, uh, begin uh, the first results, showing this last part to you guys as uh, end of the motivation. Okay, so here's the, the, the reduction I was talking about. The, in, in 2014, there were no, I'm not going to give more details later, but there were no, no many not many restrictions about who could get into this loan program. So then the program was like growing more and more year after year. And then in 2014, the government realized they, they didn't have enough money to keep the program like that. And they changed the rules suddenly in the end of 2014. And already in 2015, the number of students that were getting a loan dropped to like less than half, from 22% of the incoming students to like 12. But, and, but on top of that, from this changing rules, it was clear that this drop would continue. And you see that with this, with this new rules, we went from 22% of incoming students in 2014, all the way to like four in 2018. So it was like a very big change in the availability of financial aid in, in Brazil. Okay, so how does this, the private financial aid respond to that? You see that in 2014, the share of students that were getting some type of tuition discounts was like, it was not small, but it was a stable, something in the order of like 15%. And then right after when the new policy was implemented and it was, and it was clear that there will be very few financial, very few student loans available from now on. The number of people getting tuition discounts from their universities really skyrocketed. So that shows that universities seem to be responding uh, very strongly to changing, changing government policy with respect to student loans. And then they don't only respond only by changing their posted price, but they also change this other dimension, which is like changing the way they discriminate between students by giving discounts much more students now than they were giving before. Okay, so with this motivation in mind, this is going to be the, <clears throat> the plan for the rest of the talk. I'm going to give you more context uh, about the Brazilian higher education market, its discounts and it's how the loan program works in more detail. Then we're going to give you uh, this, this empirical evidence on how both students and colleges change their behavior when there's more or less loans available. And that's going to be the most important part of the talk today. And then third, this part three is, is work in progress which is gonna be the model I'm gonna be using to, you, to make those policy recommendations. And here I'm just gonna give you a couple of slides of motivation because that is still, uh, is still in progress. And I know I have a bit more than, an, than one hour and I probably won't, uh, won't use all of that. I'm, I most for sure won't use all of that. So feel free to interrupt me with questions whenever, whenever you get them. So, okay, let's begin with, uh, with the context. So, First, the, the data we're going to use, like I said, Brazil has very good data that covers the whole country. And I'm going to, and we put together four different data sets for this project. First, we have the university census, which shows us the universe of all students enrolled in higher education. We see the institution, the, the, the person is attending, and also the degree where she is enrolled. And we know which students have tuition discounts. So exactly which students have some support from the universities and which don't. That's how I made the plot that I, showed, that I just showed you. We put that together with a uh, data set on prices in which you observe what's the full and the, and the discounted price of each degree. 
And then third, we have the administrative data of all students receiving federal loans. So each year by year, we see each student were enrolled in the federal loan program, and we can match those data sets across each other. So we know from the census which of them are getting these loans. And then finally, we have data from the Brazilian centralized uh, exam. This exam that happens once a year, kind of similar to the SAT, but just happens once a year. And we observe the scores of all students and also a bunch of detailed demographics for all of them, for all the participants of this test. And this can all be merged across the two other data sets. So we can observe in each year, everyone who is taking the exam, and then we can follow this person into the next year to see who enrolled in college and where they enrolled and if they're getting a loan and if they're getting a discount. One clarifying question. So in the university census, the, the data there on which students have student tuition discounts, um, it's not at the institutional level, it's really at the individual student level, and it yes. actually tells you what the net price that they paid? No. No, that's going to be a limitation. So in this in the university census, it is at the student level, and but I just have a dummy, just a, a zero one. It just tells me this person has a discount, this person doesn't. Gotcha. So I don't know exactly what exactly the net price. And then I'm going to put that together with this other data set on prices in which I observe the full price of the degree. And then I observe like several different discounts. So because of this limitation, what I'm going to have to do, let's say a given degree has one full price and then four different discounts. I'm gonna to have to take the average of the four discounts and assume that all the students with discounts get the same discount. So I know how big discounts are on average for each degree, but I, I won't be able to tell which student gets a bigger discount than the other, just which students get and which students don't. Uh, does that answer your question? And yeah? what's, what's, yes, the, what's the, the, uh, the data from about prices? Where did you get that, that from? What's the source? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I was put on the button here to tell you the source. So I put together uh, four different sources. The, the, the most important one that covers already 85% of the market is from Hopper, this consultancy company. I don't know if you know, like since 2011, they, they collect prices. They just, they pretend they're students and they call the universities and they ask for, for the prices they have. And that was one source. And then as the biggest one, there are two other consulting companies that are smaller that also give me their data, which is Mercado Edu. And I forgot the name of the other one, I, I, but I remember. And then I, so I got data from these three consulting companies that do service, so that was one source. And then I also got data from Carabosa, which the, I'm gonna talk about Carabosa later for the ones that don't know. It's a platform online, but I'm gonna explain what it is. And then I also got the data from Peroni and CS, which are the fellowship and the loan program, because the institutions that are enrolled in these fellowships and the loan programs for the government, the government has to know how much they cost so they're able to pay. So I'm gonna have the data for everyone that's participating in any financial aid program from the government, these I got from the government, and I'm gonna complement that with the data from this consulting company that did the survey directly calling the universities and asking how much they cost. So these are the, the kind of three sources that we put together. Any other questions about, uh, about data? Okay, so, so let me move on. Now, let me give you like an overview of the, of the Brazilian higher education market. I think in this talk, that's not so necessary as it is in economics, but uh, I'm still gonna give it. The Brazilian higher education market is very privatized and very liberalized. 75% of the enrollment in Brazil attend a private institution. Compared to the US, it's like the opposite. The US, only 25% attend a private institution. So it's much more privatized. And while the public institutions are free, the private ones charge a tuition. So it's like a really uh, very separate system, which 25% of the people can go to public institutions for free, and 75% they have to pay and they go to a private institution. And the CS is the name of the Federal Student Loan Program. And this program, they cover 100% of tuition costs for everyone, so you don't have, so if you get the loan, it covers 100%, if you don't, it covers zero. And it has very, very subsidized interest rates. And like I showed you before, in 2014, it reached 22% of the incoming students in private institutions, and almost 80% of the institutions had at least one student with loans. So it was a very big program. And a bit more context about who are these private institutions. You shouldn't think of like anything like Stanford. You do have a few very high quality private institutions in Brazil, 
but they're not the norm at all. They're usually much lower quality than the public institutions. What I'm showing here is the distribution of the student-faculty ratio of public versus private institutions. And you see that public institutions have like a very low student-faculty ratio, which means like they have a lot of faculty per students. And on the other hand, the private institutions have like much, much more students per faculty. And like some of them have like a lot of students per faculty, which is this indication of being lower quality. And any other measure you, you compare them, like exit exams, future wages, any comparison you make, you're gonna see that the vast, with a few exceptions of high quality private institutions, the vast majority are gonna be much lower quality than the, than the public ones in Brazil. And they're also, again, with a few exceptions, but they're mostly not selective. What I'm showing here is the, is the share of spots that, that the university occupy after the entrance exams. And if for public institutions, the vast majority of public institutions occupies more than 80% of their spots. And, and many of these occupy actually 100% of their spots. On the other hand, the private institutions, very few of them occupy more than 80% of their spots. So that they really have a lot of uh, slack capacity and they're not really selective. Basically, again, for not all of them, but the vast majority, anyone that wants to get in and, ha and has the money, uh, can, can get in and this data is just making, uh, making this point. So just to sum up this part, again, when you're thinking about the private institutions in Brazil, do not, select, do not think about like an academic and very selective institution like Stanford. Think about institution that's like a for-profit institution that's not selective and it's gonna be much lower quality than the, than the public counterparts. Okay, so now let me give you uh, overview of the student loan program, the CS. And in 2014, like I said in the introduction, there was no cap in the number of students with loans in each degree. So that means that if it happens that there were, there were 100 people that decided to apply for this loan and they got the loan, and then they enrolled in economics in PUC, then they would have 100 people with the loans in economics in PUC. There are no like degree specific caps. And then the government realized they didn't have money to, to keep the program growing uh, as fast as it was. So and they, they had to find a way to restrict the program. And the way they did that, they decided to limit the number of loans per degree. They had a formula, like in the law, that based on the degree quality, region, and field of study. So like if you are from Sao Paulo, you have quality four, and your field of study is anthropology, now we can have at most, say, five people with loans in our degree. And so now I have those caps of how many people with loans you can get in each degree. And now you then also need a, a rule how we're gonna allocate those spots to students because some degrees are gonna be very high demand and then everyone we want a loan for this degree. And I don't know, I think people are sending messages. I'm not, I'm sorry, I was not seeing the messages. Yeah, I won't be able to read these messages while we speak. So if there's any questions to, to me, you can interrupt me and say, but I'll, I'll read them later if there, if there are comments. Just, just a heads up, it's too many, <laughs> too, too many things to do at the same time. Sorry. Kawe, okay, uh, uh, you may be getting to this, but uh, to what extent are, uh, is the history of, of loan repayment um, before yeah. and, and after the, the reform? Yeah, uh, I won't get to this today because not like, very uh, related to the main point. However, uh, loan repayment is very low, very, very low. Like before the reform, I think something like 60% of the people had some payments late. And I think like 30% of them just were not paying for a very long time. So it's pretty low. Uh, and after the reform, I think it's a bit too soon to, to, to know because m m most of it, the students that got in the or got in college after the reform, I still in college or just graduated like one or two years ago. So I still don't have the data for them. But before the reform, it was very low and maybe it, it got better after. And the reason why it might got, get better after, I'm gonna tell you like right now. Okay. The, actually, the first part of the answer is that now the loans are limited and one of the criteria to limit the loans is the quality of the degree. So now they're channel, they are channeling those loans to high quality degrees. And then the second part, is the way in which you allocate those loans to students. Because now I have this limited number of spots 
and then there's going to be competition for those spots and how who, how do you decide who gets the loan the first you, you still have uh income criteria both before and after you have to be below a certain income threshold to get the loan but even within poorer students you're still going to have a competition and then the way they they did it they did a centralized uh, mechanism similar to the way you allocate say medical students residencies in other countries or also students with degrees in other countries you go online in a platform you submit your preferences you say that like, i get i want a loan to this degree that's my first choice to this other degree that's my second choice and then based on these preferences and based on your scores they they allocate these loans to students basically in, in other words if, if a lot of students want loans to the same degree the ones who are higher score are going to be the ones who are going to get the loans so uh the second part to mark's question now after the policy degrees with higher quality are going to have more loans and the students with higher scores are going to be the one getting those loans so the combination of the two things i think is going to make much much more likely that people are going to repay the loans back but i'm not sure because i don't still i still don't have the data on that and and then and then like i think she knows that the system creates like a degree specific cutoff to receive loans so we have this competition for loans based on scores so then the outcome of this of this of these allocations that let's say again for the economics in Pukrio, the minimum score for people that got a loan was 700 points so people that were scoring below 700 points couldn't get a loan specifically for PUC if they wanted and people is scoring above 700 points good so it created like degree specific cutoff to get the loans and a final thing to make clear because i think people always get confused here is that this has nothing to do with admission for most degrees, admission in the private sector, admission is kind of like free, anyone can get in. This is all about who could get a loan. If you didn't get a loan here, you could still apply to the university and you probably would still be accepted. But this is just the way how the government was allocating the loans to students. That has nothing to do with, uh, with admission. Okay, so now let's move on to the last part of the, of the context with which how this tuition discounts work in Brazil. First, to note that the tuition, the discounts are very large. He employed in the distribution of the size of the of the tuition discounts, and you see like some degrees offer discounts that are like this massive, like 60, 70 percent, and the average discount is very big, it's like 35 percent. So it's not like a five percent thing to give you an extra incentive to enroll. It's something that really makes a big difference in the price you're paying. And who is getting the discounts is mostly low-income students. Got so. It. Someone I have a something? question. Okay, right. uh, yeah, about the discount. So, is that the like, is the price the price advertised by the universities, or is it like the? Are you considering like the price that students? Ah, I'm struggling to, to yeah. um, make sense of this question. But it's like the students who get discounts from Fies would get a price. But then the students who are not getting discounts from PS, what's what's the average tuition for those people? Because like my concern is that the universities are advertising a price that is actually a lot higher, so they can get more money from the government. And yeah, then yeah, you're, 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 you're what you're right. seeing is like seventy percent discounts. Is actually like no one's paying the a hundred percent. Yeah, you're 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 totally right. Actually, the the Okay, so the, the main price that I consider to be, what I consider to be the actual price of the degree without discounts and without anything, is the price that these consultants and companies collect. The price that these this companies that I say that they called and they, <clears throat> that they called and just, they just asked what the price is. <clears throat> Sorry. That, that, that's what I consider to be like the real price. And indeed you are right that when I, when I merge that with the data from CS, I do observe that the that the price that I see reported in CS is almost always some like 10 to 50 percent higher than the price that this company reports. So you're truly right that uh, the what the government's paying is always not always but usually higher than the price that you get if you just call and ask what the price is. So and yeah, so that what I'm considering to be the true full price is not what the government sees, is what the these consulting companies get when they call. And so that's what I consider to be the full price. And then it's counted. Okay.
so it was a good question. Your intuition was totally right. And it's counter price I'm getting because some of these companies, when they call, they ask, they also ask all the discounts that are available. And then I have data also on that. And I also get a discounted price from the search platforms. I'm going to talk about the search platforms in a couple of slides. So, so hold on. And okay, so then who, who is getting these discounts? Uh, they're like the key takeaway here is that they are not merit based discounts, it's not like you're going to give these discounts to people who have very high scores. It's kind of quite the opposite. They are usually need based discounts. And you can see that because here, for example, based on income, here's the self reported income for students in the when you take the centralized exam, they ask you, they have a bunch of beans from one to 17, and we have to say what's your family income level. And if you compare the self reported income with the chance of getting a discount later, you see that students in the lowest in the lower bean have almost 40% chance of getting a discount, whatever they enroll. And then students in the highest income bean have a much lower chance of getting a discount. And if you compare the chance of getting a discount with your score, then it's even more stark. Very low score students have a very high chance of getting a discount. And very high score students have a very low chance of getting a discount. Of course, it's not because universities are punishing people for getting this, for having a high score. It's because scores are very correlated with income. So these low score students are also poor and it's high on average, of course. And the high score students are also are usually rich. So that's why you see this pattern. So when you think about the discount structure throughout the presentation, you should think about really a price discrimination thing in which you're like giving discounts to people that have uh, lower willingness to pay, which are the poorest students. It not, it's not like a merit-based thing to attract the best students to your, to your university. And then the, the final thing to keep in mind is like how this targeting is made. Because I think here in the US, it's very common to do a explicit target. You have a bunch of stuff from the student's application. You ask them to report how much their family make. You ask them to report a bunch of stuff. And based on actual information, they target, they decide to get a discount and doesn't. In Brazil, the way this works is much more similar to, to the, for example, the way in which like a hotel or like an airline would price discriminate. They do like this promotion. They say like, oh, if right two weeks before the classes begin, they do a promotion. If you're not enrolled yet, enroll now, you get 40% discount. And they they keep changing the price back and forth. So they're trying to get the people who really want to pay less. And they're going to be like, keep shopping for prices until they find the best. And one example of how that really works is platforms that I've mentioned a few times. And I, I believe at least 30% of all the discounts are offered through these platforms. And they basically work kind of like Expedia. If I'm, I say I'm a university, you know, it's exactly like Expedia. <laughs> and I'm a university, I want to offer a discount. I go to the platform, I post my discount. And then people that want to study can do can their search. Here I just showed an example. I said I want to study economics in Sao Paulo. I want to pay at most 1,800 reais. And then they showed me like, oh, today you have those three discounts available. And the three discounts are very big, like on the order of like 40%, some of them, or even more. And this platform shared, shared the data with us. And for the, for, for the main project, all I'm using from their data is what's the average full price and average discounted price. But I could see how these prices were changing uh, across, across time. And it's really the way an, an airline would do it. They post a discount for two weeks and then they take it away. And then the two months don't have the full price and then they post a discount again. So they really try to get the people that are willing to be shopping for prices. And that's how they target to get the most price sensitive, to get the most price sensitive student. Excuse so again, me. Uh, hi, uh, it's Martin Carnoy. So um, you have, do they discount? Uh, I look at this test score versus discount. I'm just wondering whether yeah. they tend to discount um, the um, low return um, uh, majors, the low return programs, more than they discount, for example, engineering or um, uh, law, so that in fact uh, this is the re that it, it, you have a much lower slope on the income than you do mm -hmm. on the test score. So I'm just wondering uh, whether the discount policy varies greatly across programs. Yes. You're totally right. I, again, there's another button I should have. I would say like, 
half of this pattern here is because of what I said. Half of this pattern is because they they give less discounts to this like high return programs, exactly engineering and medicine would be the, the biggest ones in Brazil. So the correlation you're seeing here, half of that is, a, is between degrees. Is the fact that like high score degrees have less discount than low score degrees. And then, but half of the pattern is like a within degree pattern. Even within a degree, people that are higher scores are less likely to get a discount. But yeah, your intuition is totally right. But uh, is it coral, it, are the discounts also correlated with so-called quality of the institution? In other words, a lower um, quality institution, so-called lower quality or perceived lower quality institutions give larger discounts? I think, well, okay, I, within institution, it's like I said, it's more is correlated with the high and lower term majors. And across institutions, it is correlated with quality a little bit, but it's much more correlated with which, which institutions belong to, the, to these big groups. Uh, yeah, like which, are, which are more known as factory, uh, yeah, yeah. diploma yeah, factories, which, right? Yeah, exactly. Martin, Mar yeah. Martin Kawe, can I just add a point there, please? Uh, yeah. Kawe, um, if you try later to check uh, discount across institutions, maybe you have to uh, take into account that uh, the institutions that are not for profit, they are required to provide discounts and scholarships mm -hmm. and so on because they don't pay taxes at all. And it's part of the uh, na the nature of these institutions to provide discounts. Okay, mm. this is not in Fies, this is not in ProUni, but they are required to provide that. So that's, that's something you need to take care of when you try to filter the across institutions discount. Okay. Mm. Okay, so I, I, should, I should take a look at that, com mm -hmm. comparing the for profits with the not for profits. They're probably going to be different behavior. Okay, that's a very good point. Thanks. Yes. So yeah, so then we have this for profit versus not for profit that I'm not considering. So thanks for that. And but then more generally to Martin's question, this big group that owns like several hundred universities, they are the ones who offer most discounts. So that's very correlated with that. And that they are also on average lower quality, but not all. We have some high quality institutions that belong to these groups, but it's true that they are on average lower quality. So yeah, and then and then like I was saying earlier, the way they target discounts is this kind of like Expedia uh, hotels kind of kind of way. Okay, so uh, that's like the context part. So let's move on to the to the core of the of, of the paper. And uh, and what we're gonna do now is show some descriptive evidence of how both students and colleges respond to to financial aid, to specifically to student loans. And begin with students, the question you're going to be trying to answer is when you give a loan to a student, to each degree, the student is more likely to, to enroll in college because the student has a loan. And to answer this question, we're going to explore, like I said earlier, the, the fact that now we have degree specific cutoffs to, to get a loan. Like to, to give you a reminder, now we have this, this system that allocates loans to students based on, based on their scores which creates degree specific cutoffs. So for example, if you say economics in poor Creo, if you have to score at least 700 points to, to get a loan there. And another degree, it would, it would have been four, 450 points. Another degree, 500 points. And then what I'm, show, what I'm showing here is the distribution of student scores relative to the cutoff in the degree where she enrolled. So here to the right of zero, I'm showing people that I enrolled in a degree for which they scored above the minimum to get the loan. So I have a bunch of people that I enrolled in degrees in which they scored above the minimum. And here to the left of the zero, I'm showing people that I enrolled in a degree for which they scored below the minimum to get a loan because they can still enroll, they just won't be able to get a loan. And you see, I have like a big, a big jump in zero. So we have much more people enrolling in degrees for which they barely have enough points to get along then people enrolling in degrees for which they could not get along and the reason that's happening is because people uh, are selecting into degrees for which they could get loans people are people are choosing to enroll in degrees for which they could get loans and then later uh, that i won't show that today but then later when i move into my model 
I'm going to be using the size of this jump to measure exactly how much PIP, how much loans changes through the preferences. If loans didn't change the way middle people make choices at all, if people didn't care about loans, this would be flat. You would see no difference in being built above and below the minimum score. And if this was like massive, it means that people really just enroll if they have a loan. So the size of the jump is going to give us how much having a loan changes the student's choices regarding enrollment. So now uh, I'm going to move to the second piece of the of the evidence, which is how colleges respond to, to student loans. And to answer that, you're going to explore the policy change that suddenly restricted a lot the availability uh, of student loans in Brazil. And uh, the reason we should do that is that I showed you earlier that after this reform, after there were, the number of subsidized loans was reduced, the average tuition decreased. Actually, I didn't, I didn't show that, but that's, that happened. The average tuition decreased and much more students received discounts. But however, what we, we cannot know for sure if this was really because of, of the policy, because a lot, of, a lot of things were happening at the same time. Like the same year that CS was restructured, there was like a huge economic recession beginning in Brazil. So what we're gonna to try to do now is to see if those two things, the tuition going down and people getting more discounts was actually because there were less loans available and not because of, of other things that were happening at the same time. And okay, and then to answer that, we're gonna explore some details of how, the, of how the reform was done, the big reform that reduced the availability of loans. So in 2014, there are no limits in the loans per degree. Like I said, if 100 people got a loan and decided to enroll in economics in PUC, you would have 100 people in, with loans in this degree. And after 2015, we created this rule that put a cap on the number of loans per degree based on the degree's quality, field, and region. And notice here that the number of loans the degree had before the policy change is not considered. So it doesn't matter that in 2014, your degree had 80 people with loans and the other degree had two. This doesn't, doesn't go into the rule at all. So therefore, degrees that had a lot of people with loans before the policy are gonna be very affected by the policy. So an American example, to make this very clear, consider two degrees, A and B, that have exactly the same quality, the same field, and the same uh, region. And since they have the same quality, same field, and same region, they're gonna be assigned exactly the same number of loans after 2015. Let's say, for example, five. But now, uh, assume that before 2015, degree A had a lot of people with loans. So degree A had a lot of students with loans, and degree B just had five people with loans. So after the policy, they're facing the same cap, five, and before the policy, degree A had, had, had many, many more students with the loans. So therefore, degree A is gonna be super affected by the law. Degree A had, saw a decrease in, of 45 students before they had 50 students with loans, and now they just have five. And degree B is gonna be completely unaffected by the policy because before the policy, they had five students with loans. And after the policy, they still kept the same five. So for, the, for, for degree B, the policy didn't make any difference. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna compare how degrees like A, degrees that were very affected by the policy, responded to the change compared to how uh, degrees like degree B responded to the policy. And by comparing those two types of degrees, we're gonna be able to see if the increase in discount that we saw was actually because of the, of the policy change. And the way we're gonna implement that is with uh, something that's like a difference in differences, but, but more flexible, which is an event study. What we're gonna do, we're gonna regress uh, uh, outcome of interest, which could be, for example, tuition or discounts on this, on this measure of how affected the degree is. And our measure of how affected the degree is is gonna be the number of students that this degree had with loans in 2012. Following this logic that a degree that had a lot of students with loans before the policy is gonna be very affected. And then we're gonna interact that with, with ear dummies to, to see how, to both measure the trends of before the policy change and then see how, what was the effect of the policy. And we're gonna be doing that controlling by the size of the degree, by degree fixed effect and by ear fixed effect. And our sample is gonna include two years before the policy, 13, 14, and four, actually that, and three years of the policy, 15 to, to 17. Okay, so here's like the, there's, just, there's kind of like a, a, a test just to see if things make sense. 
the outcome here is the number of students receiving, uh, receiving loans each year. And you see that uh, between 13 and 14, degrees that had a lot of students with loans and degrees that had not a lot were following the same trend. They're both growing, but they're growing at the same rate. So that's why you see uh, that's a zero. And then after the policy change, you see that the degrees that before the policy had a lot of people with loans, they lost a lot. And the, the, the degrees that had very few people with loans, they didn't lose much. So that's showing us that the degree in that indeed, as you would expect, the degrees that had more people with loans before the policy were the ones that were more affected. So they lost more people with loans. Okay, so now that we see that this actually happened, how, this, the, how this, did these degrees respond? How did these degrees that were more affected respond to losing all these people with loans? So the first, the first thing that kind of summarizes everything that's gonna come later is the, what was the, the, the change in the total number of students. Okay, first notice that before the policy change, the students degrees with a lot of loans and not a lot of loans were following a similar trend. So we just have a zero here. And then after the policy change, degrees that before the policy had a lot of students with loans, so a decrease in the total number of students. And one thing to note here is the big difference in magnitudes between those two plots. So this plot shows, you see the scales are the same, and this plot shows how many students with loans a degree lost. And, that's, and the coefficient here is 0 0.7. And this plot shows what the, the change in the total number of students and the coefficient here is 0 0.2. So it's, that, that means that, let's say for each, uh, for, each seven, for each seven loans that disappeared after the policy, it's only translated into two less students. So the difference between the two dots, between that one and that one, are a bunch of people that after the policy change, they are not getting a loan anymore, but they're still enrolled in exactly the same degree they would enroll beforehand. So why is that? Why all these people are being affected by the policy? Well, the first reason is that uh, maybe some students could pay out of pocket anyway, so they wouldn't be affected regardless of anything. But then on top of that, we have to consider also the supply side responses. So how the degrees are responding to the policy. And the first of these responses is the, is the number of people getting discounts. So here's this exactly the same analysis, but now the outcome is the number of students getting discounts. And you see that the degrees that had more people with loans before the policy change increased the number of discounts after the policy. So we saw just in the, in the descriptive data showed in the beginning that after the policy change, it was like a huge increase in the number of discounts. And now I'm showing that the degrees that offered more discounts now are exactly the degrees that had people with loans before. So the story that I, to, I told in the beginning is kind of very similar to what happened, which was before the policy change, some degrees had a lot of people with loans, now these degrees that have a lot of people with loans and not have loans anymore, and now they're offering more discounts. So a part of the reason of why the drop in total number of students is, was not as big as the drop in, in loans was because now more people are getting discounts. And then finally, we also see a change in the, in the, in the tuition, not only in the discounts, but also in the posted tuition. And you see that again, in 2014, this, degrees with a lot of loans and not a lot of loans were following a similar trend. But then after the policy change, these degrees that were before relying a lot on loans, they suddenly reduce their prices. So against the same logic, certain degrees had a lot of people's loans and because of that, they were charging a very high price. And now after the, uh, there, there are not so many loans available, you, they're charging, they begin to charge a lower price. And you might wonder why the other plots, the effect was already 2015 and here for this one is not. And the reason is because the policy was announced uh, in December, in the end of the year, and class in Brazil begin in March, but basically all degrees already post their, their spots on like October, November. So it was too late for them to change the prices. They could still change their discounts, which they did, but they were only able to change their posted price uh, in the next year, in, 2000, uh, in 2016. So, so to summarize this, this section, what we saw was that you have this big policy change 
that there was a huge reduction in the number of loans available to, to students. And then we explored how certain degrees were more affected by the policy than others. And we saw that these degrees that were more affected by the policy, they lost a lot of student loans. They also lost students, but the drop in the total number of students were much smaller than the drop in the number of people getting loans. And we explained that by, by three things. Like first, some people could pay out of pocket anyway. Second, uh, students are offering more discounts to compensate for the lack of loans. And third, which is this last part, is degrees uh, reduce their, their prices. Okay, so let me move on to the, to like the last piece, which like I said, is, uh, is work in progress. So I'm gonna just give you like the broad, uh, the broad motivation for what we're doing, which is the, the structural part, the theoretical part. And the motivation for this part is exactly the, the, what I just said, like the lessons we took from the empirical exercise. And the lessons were that when you have less government aid available, specifically less uh, student loans, it seems that institutions decrease their tuition and they offer more discounts. However, this like reduced form uh, results. So like the, the results that uh, I just showed, they do not fully capture what was the fact of the policy. And the reason is they don't fully capture the fact of the policy is because when you have a huge policy like that, that affects the whole market, no one's then affected. So I was comparing degrees, what well, I was comparing the behavior of degrees that had a lot of people with loans before with degrees that didn't have people with loans before and, and seeing how they were behaving differently. But I can say that the degrees that didn't have loans before were like a pure control group because they were, they were also affected by the policy. Even degrees that, that didn't have anyone with loans were also affected by the policy because now, for example, a bunch of people that were previously going to a degree that had loans, this degree doesn't have loans before, now I'm gonna go to my degree. So basically everyone's affected when you have a huge policy like that. So what we're gonna try to do with this model is to take into consideration this, all these generic equilibrium responses to, to use like theory combined with the results I just showed you to be able to estimate us the total effect of financial aid on price and enrollment while taking into account the equilibrium effects. And then once you have this model, we're gonna do what the kind of like a final goal of the, of the project, which is to be able to simulate the outcomes of different financial aid programs. And now I actually can give a bit more details by what exactly I mean. Like I said, here in, the, in Brazil, the government was out, out of money. So they, they put a cap in the, the maximum number of loans that each degree could get. And they did it following kind of like a intuitive rule of like giving more discounts to, more, giving more loans to degrees that are high quality. What, I wanna, what we wanna do here is to, is to try to compare what would be the outcome if those caps were different. If they would give more cap, more loans to this region or more, more loans to this other region, or maybe more loans to low quality degrees, or maybe more loans to certain fields, and then compare what would be the outcome in the end of all these different types of programs, and then see which of these programs achieve our goal, which is to maximize uh, enrollment, in particular enrollment of low-income students. And the important thing to keep in mind here is that uh, in, in order to simulate those outcomes, what we're gonna try to do, what we're trying to do, is to take into consideration how uh, colleges are gonna respond to the, to, the, to, the, to the difference in policies and how these response are gonna depend on which of these designs. And the uh, intuition on, on how we are gonna capture that in the model is gonna be just by modeling how the student loans interact with price discrimination. And the intuition is the following. Like I said earlier, the private colleges, they price discriminate. And the way this price discriminates in Brazil is like I said, very much like Expedia does or airlines does. They're really trying to find who is the most price elastic people, people who are willing to be searching for these discounts and they give discounts to them. So the decision of colleges to, to price discriminate is gonna depend on how price elastic students are because they're only gonna be trying to find who's the most price elastic person to give this person a discount. That's on, the, on one hand. And then on the other hand, the having a government loan changes the student's price elasticity, change how students are sensitive to prices. And that's gonna be a, 
a result you're going to find, but it's just very intuitive. Someone that has a loan is going to be much, much less, someone that has not only a loan, but has like a super subsidized loan, is going to, is going to be much less sensitive to, to changes in prices of the degrees when they're making the choices. So when you put those two things together, that on the one hand, these colleges are offering discounts and they're trying to offer these discounts to the most price sensitive person. And then on the other hand, that having a loan is going to change how price sensitive you are. You're going to find that the, this price stimulation policies that degrees follow are going to depend very, very strongly on what the, the current student policy, what's the current student loan policy in place. And like we saw in the data that did happen, like when there were a lot of loans available, there were very few discounts. And then when suddenly there were not so many loans available, there were a lot of discounts. And this is how we're gonna try to capture in the model this, uh, this mechanism that we saw in the data. So, so that's it, I'm gonna conclude and tell, discuss briefly my next steps with you guys. So just to take in stock of what we, of what we discussed today, we found that uh, subsidizing loans do increase enrollment in higher education. So we saw that students that were, were scoring above the minimum score to get loans were much more likely to, to enroll in college. So loans are effective in increasing enrollment. But then on the other hand, colleges do respond to, they do respond to the availability of student loans by increasing prices and also reducing discounts. And that's likely to reduce the effect of the policy. So with that in mind, our, our next steps is to, is to finish estimating the, the model that I was just discussing the intuition with. And our goal with this model is that once we have the model, we're gonna be able to simulate what's gonna be the outcomes of different loan programs and then propose which of these different designs delivers the best, uh, the best results. So, like I said, I did finish earlier. I didn't use the whole one hour and 20, I think I had, but I'm gonna stay here online longer if anyone wants to discuss something. So thanks everyone for coming and for the, for the comments.